Some race car fans like to compare IndyCar to Formula One, and I used to think those people were idiots. But both series have been increasing in popularity, and since they're both single-seat open-wheel race cars, they even look a little bit alike, kind of like me and the guy from The Mandalorian. But that's a lot like comparing apples to oranges, McLarens to Hellcats, Giselle Bundchen to Steve Buscemi. One does some things better than the other, but the differences are what make them both cool. And the best part is, you don't have to choose. You can have both of them at the same time, a Buscemi Bunchin baby. So today we're gonna dig into how IndyCar differs from F1 and why it might be better. Let's go. Big thanks to Pedal for sponsoring this video. Pedal is a credit card company that wants you to succeed financially. That's why the Pedal 2 card is designed to help you build credit. When you apply for Pedal 2, your banking history may be used to instantly create a cash score, a non-traditional measure of your credit worthiness based on income, spending, and savings. If you're approved, Pedal is partnered with WebBank member FDIC, which issues the card. Pedal 2 credit limits start at $500 and range up to $10,000 based on your credit worthiness, which can help keep your credit utilization low, a key component to building credit. And unlike most credit card companies, the Pedal 2 Visa card has no annual fee or any other kind of fees. And the best part, your cash back grows with you. You'll get 1% cash back right away and up to 1.5% cash back when you make 12 on-time monthly payments and keep your account in good standing. Plus, you can even use their app to make those payments, track spending, and manage subscription spending. Whoa! As of today, the Pedal 2 variable APR ranges from 12.99% to 26.99% based on credit worthiness. So start building your credit history and click the link below or go to pedal, that's with a T, card.com slash donut today to find out more. Oh, hey James. Apart from the windscreen, an Indy car and a Formula One car look like they might be pretty similar, but there are some huge differences, and the biggest by far is the gold-plated diamond-encrusted elephant in the room, the cost. A competitive IndyCar, it isn't cheap. It can cost around $3 million. That includes the cost of different parts for various tracks, testing, and enough engines and gearboxes to last an entire season. But that's a bargain compared to an F1 car. At checkout, an F1 car is gonna ring up between 14 and $20 million. That's for one car and engine, no spares included, and it doesn't even touch the cost to design and develop each of Formula One's 10 unique chassis. See, each of the Formula One constructors are required to design their own car within the FIA regulations. That's the formula. Every team's chassis and aerodynamics will be a bit different from everyone else's, and a team can be penalized for copying another car's design. This might sound familiar. This happened to Racing Point in 2020 when they were fined for having parts too similar to the previous year's Mercedes. Unlike Formula One, Indy cars are supposed to be similar, and to accomplish this, they use many spec components. Those are parts that teams buy from a third party and are identical for everyone. Since the teams don't have to do all the individual R&D for those components, that keeps IndyCar's costs at just a fraction of what's found in F1. The chassis and aerodynamic parts of every IndyCar are designed and built by Dallara, an Italian manufacturer specializing in race cars. They build components for Le Mans, Formula 2 and 3, and even the upcoming next-gen NASCAR. IndyCar teams simply buy a pre-made chassis from Dallara for $349,000. Hmm. Nice. The downside of spec parts is that you don't have individual teams innovating or developing new designs that push the sport forward like you do in Formula One. But everyone having numerous identical parts means that one team can't win simply by out-engineering or outspending their competition. And in F1, one of the biggest targets of engineering and spending is in the engines. Formula One has four engine manufacturers, Mercedes, Ferrari, Renault, and Honda. The F1 power unit is the most expensive part of the car and a single one can cost $11 million. But Mercedes has spent a total of 1.2 billion over seven years to develop their current power unit within the strict FIA regulations. For that price, they've got a state-of-the-art turbo hybrid 1.6 liter V6 capable of producing over a thousand horsepower. IndyCar has just two engine manufacturers. They got Honda and they got Chevrolet. And teams can choose which engine to buy for their cars. Those engines cost a thrifty 125 grand or about 99% cheaper than an F1 engine. Does that mean you're getting 99% less power? <laughs> no, 
and you don't. These are state-of-the-art twin-turbo 2.2-liter V6s capable of 750 horsepower. Each horsepower in an Indy car costs a measly $167. In F1, you're paying $11,000 per pony. How much power an engine makes depends heavily on how much fuel it consumes. And one of the challenges for F1 engineers is FIA regulations that limit fuel consumption. The total fuel allowed for one Grand Prix is limited to 110 kilograms, around 145 liters. There's no refueling during pit stops and the fuel flow rate can't exceed 100 kilograms an hour. A thousand horsepower Bugatti Veyron can drain its 100 liter tank in just 12 minutes. Developing an engine capable of a thousand horsepower that can last an entire two hour race with just 135 liters of fuel is a huge engineering challenge that costs a lot of money to figure it out. Indy cars don't have the same limitations. Even though their fuel tanks are about half the size at 70 liters, they do refuel during pit stops and there's no limitation on how much fuel they can use in a race or how quickly it flows to the engine. IndyCar engineers don't have to spend as much time thinking about fuel economy, which means power is cheaper and easier than it is in F1. Even though there are no restrictions on fuel consumption, IndyCar does restrict the amount of turbo boost for different conditions. Depending on whether the car is qualifying or racing, and depending on the track, cars have between 18 and 22 PSI of boost, which means actual power varies between 550 and 700 horsepower. But drivers can also briefly increase boost to 24 PSI, producing the engine's maximum power with a push to pass button on the steering wheel. F1's DRS system also makes passing easier by reducing drag, but DRS only works under conditions specified by the FIA and only at certain parts of each track. An IndyCar driver, it's free to push that push to pass button whenever they choose. They can use the power to pass like the name says, or to defend against a pass. But push to pass is only available for a total of about 200 seconds per race varying by track. When to use it and how many times, that's up to the driver. Now 750 horsepower sounds pretty good to me and I'm not sure the extra power of a Formula One engine is worth the $10.8 million price difference. Formula One gets criticized for being a series where the deepest pockets often win and runaway costs like these are why the FIA instituted a budget cap of 145 million per team in 2020. But somehow Mercedes managed to spend 450 million last year, three times the budget cap. So how is that even possible? Well, remember all that engine development they do? That's exempt from the cap, along with a ton of other costs like driver salaries, travel costs, and even marketing. But cash like that can buy a lot of speed. The fastest speed ever recorded in an F1 race was back in 2016 when Valtteri Bottas reached 231 miles per hour at the Mexican Grand Prix. 231 miles per hour is pretty fast, but it's also slower than 236 miles per hour, which is what most Indy cars reach during ordinary laps at the Indy 500. And all that speed can be yours for an annual team budget of just $10 million, 440 million less than Mercedes F1 budget. To put that in perspective, 440 million is more than the annual GDP of Tonga. Now you guys are put back into perspective. <laughs> so with more power and a country's worth of money, why do F1 cars have lower top speed than Indy cars? Well, despite the superficial resemblance, these really are two different series. The cars are designed for different rules, different goals, and for their own types of races. F1 races happen on just two kinds of tracks. You got road courses like Silverstone, and you got street courses like Monaco. But in addition to road and street circuits, IndyCar also runs on speedways, more commonly known as ovals, even though many of them aren't oval, like Indy, which is kind of a rectangle. Both F1 and Indy cars are developed and configured for the type of tracks they use, and a lot of the differences come down to their aero dynamics. F1 aero packages are designed for cornering speed. Aero parts, like the front ring, have small specialized elements to fine tune the car's downforce. If you look closely, you can see differences in these parts between all of the teams, and variation for different racetracks, as engineers experiment with new designs to maximize cornering grip. It's hard to say how much F1 aero costs to develop, but most teams have entire departments of engineers dedicated to aerodynamics. Even a conservative estimate will be in the millions of dollars. 
but that expensive aero limits F1 cars' top speed. F1 cars can produce over five Gs of downforce. Effectively, that means the faster the car goes, the more it weighs. At five Gs of downforce, the engine has to move five times the car's weight, meaning the power to weight ratio is five times worse. Even with a thousand horsepower, there's a point where the engine simply can't overcome the weight and drag and go any faster, and that's the aerodynamically limited top speed. But all that downforce maximizes cornering grip, which maximizes cornering speed. And the advanced aero and extra power of an F1 car is why on a road course, it will smash an Indy car's lap time. The only track that both of these cars have recently visited is the Circuit of Americas in Texas. At one minute, 37 seconds per race lap, the F1 car is 11 and a half seconds faster than the Indy car. Even with IndyCar taking a pretty liberal stance on track limits, IndyCars at Austin can't match the F1 car's speed. Like the engine and chassis, IndyCar Aero is made up of spec parts. Each team gets the same aerodynamic package to keep costs down and keep the field competitive. That aero kit costs just 70 grand, and since it's also made by Delera, they'll give you a discount if you buy it at the same time as the chassis. It's like, it's like Little Caesars of IndyCar parts. You buy a pizza chassis and you get Crazy Bread Aero at a discount. You guys eat Little Caesars, don't act like you're special. That IndyCar Aero package isn't as sophisticated as what you'd find on an F1 car. The front wing has just three relatively basic aerodynamic elements, whereas F1 cars have five, with numerous winglets and vortex generators. The IndyCar rear wing also includes three elements. F1, they just have to get by with just two. Sad trombone. But it has DRS, vortex generators, and a bunch of other little bits and pieces. And that's all due to the biggest cost difference. F1 Aero comes with a team of engineers who are constantly testing and fiddling to optimize for the precise conditions of one specific race. The IndyCar Aero has just three pre-made configurations and only very small amounts of adjustments. It's enough to keep like one engineer busy for an entire afternoon. But that discount Aero turns out to be the key to IndyCar's top speed. In its highest downforce configuration, the kit can make just four Gs, or about 2,500 kilograms of downforce. That's about 500 kilograms less than an F1 car. So even if an Indy car had 1,000 horsepower, it still couldn't outcorner an F1 car. However, on a speedway like one in Indianapolis, an F1 car would be fighting against its own downforce. The Indy car can just switch to its low downforce aero configuration. That removes all but a single element from the front and rear wings and only produces 2.5 Gs of downforce. That's just a third of what the F1 car has, and it's why the IndyCar can reach a higher top speed with just 700 horses. Formula One tries to institute cost-cutting measures, but that's difficult because it still wants to be a showcase for new technology in engineering battles. IndyCar is different. Instead of making individual teams innovations into part of the show, they make it cheaper for teams to compete and on a more even playing field. And because of that, it's attracted racers from all over. In this year's past Indy 500, eight of the drivers on the grid had F1 experience. That includes Roman Grosjean, Kevin Magnussen from the Haas F1 team, and Marcus is Ericsson from Alfa Romeo. And he even said, I wouldn't be surprised to see more F1 drivers looking to come here. I prefer racing in IndyCar. Yeah. The diversity of tracks and drivers makes IndyCar a fan series too. And it's cost cutting measures have kept ticket prices low. You can go watch an IndyCar race for under 50 bucks and even get a pit and paddock pass for around a hundred bones. Paddock access in the F1, that costs thousands of dollars. Those different philosophies end up producing lots of differences between the two series, including lots of stuff we don't have time to talk about. Kind of like Steve Buscemi and Giselle Bündchen. Who, who else has called Steve Buscemi, Steve Buscemi, and not Steve Buscemi? If you've been calling Steve Buscemi, Steve Buscemi for a while, leave a comment down below. Because apparently I'm an idiot and I've been calling him that. And I'm gonna keep calling him that. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of B2B. You know, we've always wanted our own F1 car here at Donut, but it's pretty pricey. So maybe we get an Indy car. Well, who do you think our main sponsor should be? What should we put on the car? Leave your comments down below. Uh, follow us here on Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. I have a TikTok, but they banned me, so you can't find me on there unless Suck My Science apparently just shows up and they allow people to search for it. But until next week, bye for now.